Hello. Has the product design obsession with frameworks and process led to everyone working on autopilot, churning out bland monoculture of design? When are they useful and when do they simply become a crutch? Have we hit peak framework? Welcome to Power of 10, a show about design operating at many levels of Zoom, from thoughtful detail through to transformation in organizations, society, and the world. My name is Andy Polane. I'm a design leadership coach, service design and innovation consultant, educator, and writer. My guest is James Nell, founder of Path, a consultancy that helps organizations play the long game through design led strategy. James was head of insight for pioneering service design agency Live Work in the early years of service design practice, which is where we met. He worked on service transformation for brands such as the NHS, BBC, Aviva, Johnson & Johnson, eBay, Gov.uk, HMRC, that's the, the, the customs people, uh, and revenue tax office, right? And led transformation design uh, team at Westpac in Australia, where he joins us now, uh, delivering their digital mortgage services. James, welcome to Power of 10. Hi, Andy. Thank you. So, um, first of all, tell us, I've got a little bit of a bio there, but tell us a little bit about your background and work before we get on to the framework question. Um, so, I, I'm a, a, what I guess I call a design-led strategist. My background is in uh, research. Um, I'm a sociologist, that's what I studied. Um, and I got involved um, in early days of service design um, from, from the research side. And over time, my practice grew uh, to incorporate more strategy. So as I added more design in, I guess I've become um, more uh, uh, what I would what I would call a, a strategist. So I describe myself as a strategist, and I describe what I do as design led strategy um, rather than necessarily design strategy, um, because it incorporates a lot of different uh, elements of of a strategic practice, um, but always bringing um, some of the, the kind of elements of design that I think are uh, powerful ways of, of working and thinking um, that, that you don't necessarily get with a very kind of analytic um, approach. And so, you know, when when you say it's design-led, the, the, yeah, what is sort of particularly designerly about, I guess, about it when you say those things add a different edge to a, um, to a normal strategy practice? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> We're probably getting quite quickly into, into what we've um been been kind of talking about speaking about today because I think what design adds is the ability to um, to make leaps um, to 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 synthesize things and make jumps that don't necessarily follow a linear path um, that don't necessarily um, go a to b or one plus two equals three um, design mm -hmm. is is quite powerful at allowing you to bring things together and find patterns or synthesize things in a, in a in a way which can be quite unique or, um, or, or, or different, um, and also to work quite quickly at synthesizing patterns. So I, think, I think design's got a, 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 um, something to offer massively in terms of um, bringing things together in a slightly different way um, around a problem um, that you, you don't necessarily get when you're following something in, in, a, in a purely analytic um, framework. We are indeed getting close to what we're going to talk about. Um, I guess there's one of these things. There's a, there's a phrase, I think I've heard it from Stephen Johnson, but I'm pretty sure I've heard it from, uh, I think it might have come from somewhere else. So the, the idea of an intermediate impossible or impossible intermediate, I can't remember what it is. But this idea of um, when thinking through, say, something like a strategy or thinking through how you might tackle some, uh, a problem or, or the beginnings of a solution, there's a bit in the middle that you don't, you're not really very sure about. Um, you don't even know if it's going to work. But the idea of this sort of intermediate impossible is that we kind of assume, let's assume that's going to work. But let's assume we can solve that and then jump ahead and also kind of work on the, mm. the thinking after that and then, and then move back. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about with that kind of nonlinear path as well? Yeah, I, I think, I think we, we've kind of developed a kind of comfort with that level of ambiguity in, in design. Yeah. And, and uh, caveat all of this, um, there's crossover everywhere, <laughs> everything we're talking about. Um, and, and and so um, yeah, when I talk about the role or, or the the extra thing that design adds, it's a little bit of freedom to play with these um, with these kind of strict boundaries um, that I think unlocks a whole lot of possibilities that you that you you lose when you try to follow um, follow you know very very strictly from one step to the other. Um, 
And in a way, <laughs> I mean, that's, I guess, the risk that we're kind of talking about here. Um, by becoming very, very process-focused, design tends to uh, kind of mitigate that, that, that kind of what can be its superpower. Yeah. And so what are you seeing going on? Because I th- think this conversation about frameworks started in the comments about something, I, I think, and um, talking about frameworks. And there was, you know, I, I was complaining, I think, about this idea that, you know, I see frameworks as uh, they're, they're very useful. I mean, I teach them, right? So I'm, a, I'm an educator and I train people in, in service design and other things and, and, um, and obviously and, and teach at university. And so I, I'm teaching frameworks. I'm well aware that I, I do that. And particularly around research, I talk about it and synthesis. They're, they're very useful. But I mean, we may need to go, as they say in uh, Sound of Music, back to the very beginning of what we mean by a framework, actually, and before we get onto the sort of crutch aspect of it. But the thing I was complaining about in the comments was this idea that I think I see, you know, I see everyone from students to people working commercially, uh, professionally, sometimes you use frameworks without the sort of depth of critical thought behind those frameworks, mm-hmm. I guess, and they can become a crutch. And I think when, when we work at speed, which is obviously the, there's this kind of massive pressure always, we end up kind of just skimming those things and using those things without kind of uh, much, much thought. But let's go back to the beginning, because um, you also wrote a piece about this, but I want to sort of just define our terms. What is a framework in, in your book? I, I, I was thinking about it a little bit. Actually, actually, I'm quite quite glad that I came up with a bit of a um, a bit of a <laughs> kind of categorization for this because because when I when I when I thought this through, it helped me a lot with some of the. Um, I have some of that same um, kind of discomfort with, I guess, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, yeah. uh, I've worked with frameworks for, and they've almost been the core elements of a strategic output for a long time. And right? a lot of the time when you're working with strategy, what you're doing is breaking down ideas and recompiling them in a different way. The outputs are sort of irrelevant. Like it starts with the core of the idea and how that shifts something. So I, I've always thought of frameworks as like the, the engine of my practice. But then over the last few years, I've been getting more uncomfortable because um, I've been seeing frameworks become more and more kind of driving what people are doing um, and almost driving a kind of completionist type attitude to things. And I think it's taken a lot of the focus of the work. So what I've been trying to do with teams that I've been working with is to say, we need to bring the focus away from the structure of the information that you're working with and actually look at the work. What's the quality of the work? How fit for purpose is it? What is it doing um, in the in the job that we're trying to accomplish? Um, so what I've been thinking about is um, is actually the, like the the framework is different to a topology or taxonomy and and I think a lot of what we, we when we're saying framework a lot of what we're actually talking about is kind of a process or a taxonomy a kind of a structure for information but not the information itself um, uh, so if you go to I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on jobs to be done um, if you look at jobs to be done a milkshake the framework would be uh, commute, slow, uh, cold, um, uh, a certain viscosity, so that it's you know slow to drink. That that's the actual content of the framework. That that tells you something about the thing. Um, but the uh, you know the the structure of how you write a, an empty templated jobs to be done. That's that's not a framework necessarily in in this in this model. That's just a taxonomy. And so I started to think there's a distinction there with like an epistemology, how you do something, a process, and an ontology, like what is the actual thing that you're designing. Um, and and I, that distinction helps me massively because I start to think, well, actually, I'm really focused in thinking about the meaning side of it. Um, and, and, and that's useful to have a structure and useful to have a model that describes things. Um, but it's not necessarily the same thing as you should fill out this canvas um, and then you're going to get to a quality outcome. There's a subtle distinction between them that I, that I think is, is, really, is really helpful. Yeah, and so, you know, obviously everyone loves a canvas, it seems, or at least uh, us people who write things like, like a canvas. And, it, you know, as you know, so the way I think about frameworks or the primary two that kind of come to mind for me in, in service design 
are things like, well, Jobs to Blue Down is obviously one, but things like um, I, journey maps and blueprints, right, are also a kind of framework I keep trying to sort of emphasize to my students that they're a framework for synthesis, right? They're not really a kind of thing that you are just kind of filling in mm. and it's done. And, and I kind of hate hearing, I know there's a reason for it, but I kind of hate hearing how, you know, my boss has asked me to design you know, or the client has asked us to kind of uh, design three journey maps or five, six journey maps, or whatever. And that's often procurement driven too. But with this idea of like, there's just a sort of a, a bunch of these things you can design as artifacts and that's the kind of end result. And obviously those things are a means to an end anyway. And I think that's probably another thing to remember about frameworks is that they're a means to an end. But they're a way of taking a lot of messy stuff, say multiple people's, the research of multiple people's journeys through something, and and simplifying it and uh, synthesizing it into some kind of structure that um, that aligns and matches up. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you agree with that uh, with those as frameworks, or if they are they just simply you know uh, artifacts of methods. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I think I, I, in in this in this kind of process template topology versus mm. versus framework kind of uh, distinction that I'm using, like the journey map on its own is a uh, is you know it's just a grid, yeah. and, and that and that's a template, um, and so then we're going to be careful with the dangers of that, which is drives a sort of completionism. So I mean, yeah. everybody yeah. that's done this kind of work will be familiar. Well, there's blank spaces there. Well, okay, we need to come up with something. Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so you get more focused on filling out every cell in the canvas um, than you do in actually thinking about what the content is and is it the right thing for the problem um, yeah. um so the framework would be well that the actual content of a particular problems journey map. I mean, it, it's useful that this is yeah. incredibly useful um the, the other the other bit where i think um thinking this through a framework is really useful is when and and again this is kind of framework as embodied knowledge is when it's an accelerator to understanding a new space um so you come to a problem, um, you know, wh whatever, it, whatever it might be, and you download a previous kind of piece of work or theory or literature that has already thought through the problem and created a structure of, you know, structured framework around the knowledge in that space. Um, well, that's, you know, if you haven't ever dealt with that space before, that's a massive accelerator to, um, to understanding a new space. And it might also be things that, you know, other people are, building off that same theoretical knowledge. And so you're, you're able to kind of collaborate with people better around, around that space. But that's the knowledge, not the kind of boxes in which we put the knowledge. Yeah. Um, and so I think like, like uh, when, when you make this distinction, I'm sort of, I, I've almost been in my notes, I've been writing process and template and framework almost interchangeably because I think what we're talking about a lot of it is if you follow you know, this set formula, you're going to get to a quality outcome. And that's sort of, I guess, the heart of my problem with this whole space is that yeah, I think we've, yeah. we've removed ourselves a little bit from you know, examining the work and thinking critically about the work and trying to think about what is needed, what is actually the next thing that you need to do to improve the output of whatever it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I've always felt and said that the, you know, it's the conversations in front of a... A journey map or a blueprint. You said it in this article, actually. Uh, you said this thing about it's a framework's a useful way to kind of uh, order your thinking, right? And I think that one of the things that happens, that's why I keep coming back to that sort of synthesis analysis, synthesis stage, because it's probably sort of the really messy stage. There's a kind of ideation end of things, too, I think, and the, and the kind of what should we be doing? We've got a million ideas where they often come in. And, and I guess that also comes in at the strategic level, too. Um, where um, you know you're you're thinking things through in a framework kind of helps give you some order through which you're you're thinking and I, you know arguably that's what the kind of business model canvas does it's not you know it's just a it's also just a grid but it, it does a thing where it kind of forces you to think it's not sort of good housekeeping forces you to kind of think around all the facets mm -hmm. of a particular area in a way that your habit might kind of uh, not get you to. And it, you know, and it can kind of help you. And any of those, many of those product frameworks are um, a way to kind of look at that. Some of them kind of take a zoom level up, like like safe, like scaled agile framework for enterprise. Which, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just leave that there. 
But there is a, um, you know, there's a thing with those, they're not only beloved of kind of product people, they're beloved of management consultants, right, of, for whom I've worked. I've seen so many kind of frameworks on slides, which kind of seem to consist of a lot of boxes surrounded by some other boxes and arrows from each box pointing to every other box. And, and I kind of think, okay, in what way does that help? What, what's that communicating to me? I'm, and you're just telling me stuff's complicated and everything's related to everything else. And so, you know, there's a there's a point where the framework seems just to become detached from uh, from the actual work itself, and it sort of seems to become a thing that helps us to kind of vaguely talk about stuff, but actually the work on the ground really departs uh, from what that framework mm. is supposed to be doing. Have you seen that going? I, I see that going on all the time. The, the distinction that I make around around that is probably. Um, a, 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 Actually, it's useful to have a good and a bad, <laughs> you know, an understanding <laughs> of just quality or not quality, and and that's really, I guess, what I'm trying to kind of build. Where in this idea of kind of judgment or evaluation, um, is actually, you know, looking at the work and going, where does it need to go next? It's largely a matter of going, you know, is it good enough for the purpose that we need, and that's the driver. So, so rather than the category itself being good or bad in itself, like it's the same thing with process. Like you run a process. It doesn't mean the output is good, right? Like you still have to operate it well to, to get a good quality outcome. And you've got to look at it and go, did we get a good quality outcome? No, throw it out, start again, or you know, whatever the case might be. Um, I was looking at um, some of Lauren Tan's uh, PhD work um, yeah. earlier because, um, because I, just thinking about that idea of kind of process, not process. And I remember, you know, she... She wrote this PhD on dots 07, so this is dating dating me quite a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but but talking about um, ideas um, and and I hadn't I hadn't clocked this kind of reference as much, but Keir Storst's work on um, like we rely and have come to rely too much on process. So he had and and again we can talk is this a framework or a, a taxonomy or, or or what is it? But he's talking about the objects of the work. The context of the work and the actors involved in the work, rather than yeah. necessarily just the process, and so it's maybe it's a rebalancing of these kind of priorities and thinking about like, well, well, actually, if we've lost a little bit of the focus on the work because we've been concentrating on removing ourselves as designers um, from the work and uh, you know almost kind of anonymizing the design, anybody can do it. It's you know it's a capability that anybody can learn. That's all kind of really noble but it loses something around how you actually do work you know like work happens a particular piece of work happens by somebody yeah. and whether it's a designer or not is kind of irrelevant um but the outcome of the work has a certain quality and uh you know i think it, it's it, it's it's sad in a way to lose um the expertise of saying somebody that is you know put a lot of time and effort into growing a practice around achieving quality outcomes is is anonymous or kind of decent and it's not really you know there's not the right terms to kind of talk about decentering or not but like incorporated in the in the in the in the work or the thinking yeah i mean i i have done my bit of teaching you know training design teams and i it's been often under the guise of uh, or not non-designers under the guise of kind of design thinking which i've always you know slightly felt uncomfortable about felt a bit queasy about but one of the things i've noticed and you know again i notice it with students too partly because at that stage of their careers that they sort of don't know any better in some respects too and they're just learning those things but i certainly see it with professionals is you know and i guess the thing about design thinking is you can you can skim the surface um i notice it in coaching too there's lots of sort of coaching frameworks and things like that and whenever i've experienced them as a coachee i've always felt like you can kind of skim you can go through the steps Mm. Um, but not actually do the work, you can't sort of, and not really get into the depth. So personally, the way I coach is much more, of, um, it follows much more of a kind of style that's similar to a sort of psychoanalyst uh, style, um, where you know there are some tools and activities, but they are to get us somewhere rather than you know to to sort of fill the fill in the boxes um, or check the boxes. And one of the things that comes up quite often um, is this idea of. How do you know when the framework or the method or the process, and I, I use those kind of as one sort of bucket more or less, to mean a thing I'm borrowing from someone else or that someone else has done and I'm applying to my work, so roughly, you know, to say, you know, someone else has done this, someone else has come up with this 
framework, this method, this methodology, this is a process, uh, and we're going to use it for our work. Um, and I feel like the there's always this question is, it's not working for some reason. If we're not getting the results we're after, how do you develop the critical thinking or the, the ability to say, you know what, this is the wrong method or the wrong framework mm. to be using for this problem at hand versus we're doing it wrong? It's, I mean, it's interesting because uh, I... I almost think like it doesn't come up in my practice that I that that the problem doesn't come up in my practice because I'm always treating f- the framework as the output, not the input. Right. So you're always working on it, and so you you might borrow a piece from something or a piece from something else, but you but your focus is continuously on the outcome. I, it's almost you know it's like this piece of the puzzle comes from here, um, and it's working, and that piece isn't working, so let's get rid of it. And and we'll bring in something else from somewhere else, and and that might be completely new. It might be from another piece of work or understanding. But the critical thing is always the question: Is it working? I don't know. I, just, I feel like it's a maybe it's a glib answer because it seems to kind of skirt the question. But actually, I think it's quite critical to this idea of like, well, actually, that is your role as the uh, as the kind of um, developer of this piece of work is to be critically assessing it. Um, I've been I've been thinking a lot. I I use software metaphors yeah. quite a lot in my thinking. I've been thinking about what a stack might look like, where you've you know you've got a, a library that you're using for a particular piece of the puzzle, and then another thing that you use for something else, and you're kind of trying to, I guess, to have a little bit of material honesty about you know how those pieces all fit together, and then and then also you know knowing that as you're building that stack up, you're kind of relying on 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 relying on things that, and, and being clear about where they do and don't work. Um, it sort of gets to uh, like another one of the, 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 the tricky bits when you do this and you maybe kind of go back to the scaled agile um, mm. example without, without trying to, <laughs> without trying to open without a, bagging a, a, it up too without much. opening a box of, a box of, a box of frogs. Um, but, but, but what that's trying to do is, 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 and, and 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 other frameworks trying to do that same thing is they're trying to add kind of collaboration around a common reference point, and yeah. that's incredibly valuable, particularly at scale. So you need to be able to work on multiple pieces of the same problem when you're working in at, you know, multiple teams. Um, and, and so so there is a call there for well, let's build some standardization around a particular piece. Um, the tricky bit comes when you are then kind of reliant on a piece of framework that's not working um but as a part of the kind of collaborative engineering right so um so so there's a there's a you know how do you be critical about the frameworks that you're using and how you're using them and how do you build in a bit of um interoperability without holding things holding things back like you still need to have a kind of a bleeding edge Um, and so maybe there's this kind of idea of a framework stack and you know some teams are running the bleeding edge and other people are running the stable one and depending on your kind of ability to navigate the the kind of edge cases that might come up from using the framework mm. that you're using you kind of you, you, you select the stack that you um, that, that you can operate there's a there's a um, Connor just made this comment about um, you know this deli- there's a delicate line between using a framework um, to help build an understanding and around the focus area and overly abstracting it the information that's actually important and I kind of feel like there is a um, relationship here obviously between what we're just saying at the strategic level of things um, you know as you kind of zoom out you start to look like you start to look at organizational frameworks right and look how this is so we've got this framework. So this is how we're going to then structure teams and who's going to be in these these teams. And this is and then who is going to be managing those teams and there are kind of power structures that start to uh, creep in with those frameworks. And again, I feel like those things start to get abstracted from uh, the real work on the ground, right? how those teams actually work versus the sort of idealized model of it. And I guess, you know, the more strategic you go, the more that's happening too, right? Where you're getting that kind of abstraction of this seems like kind of a nice idea, but in practice it doesn't work. Mm. Is that a problem for you for in the strategic end of things? It partly, maybe I wonder if there's something to do with the kind of the feedback loop is longer too. Yeah, yeah. By which I mean, you know, here's a hypothesis about something and then we're going to kind of try and do it and then we get some data in return. 
once we do it. You know, strategic work, there's a longer kind of feedback loop there. I, I, I think I think sometimes with the strategic work, there's an output of that strategic work and an impact in a kind of a broader ecosystem that that is on a slower cycle. Um, but a lot of the time you get feedback really, really quickly in terms of the cognition of the idea that you're working with. So is it you know, is it resonating with the team around you? Um, and, and I think if you if you shift your idea of strategy from like a, an idea of this is purely an idea based thing about something in the future and this kind of romantic idea of strategy to um, well actually strategy is the work on the ground to get people to understand what you're even saying um, or right. shift or shift the context in which they're trying to think about something you actually I, I don't know you you have a you have a, a strategic focus which is about preparing the ground a lot of the time more than necessarily so, so and that might be more of like a meso strategic kind of ground that that really covers um in the far off strategy world um you a lot of the time are actually freer you know the the, the, the stakes aren't the same and and then in in the more near term where you're trying to translate that abstraction into something that teams can actually work with uh, the, the practicalities of making it understandable are incredibly critical so a lot of the time what i am trying to do and and the framework is it's an ontological exercise of trying to reframe the way that people are thinking about something yeah. um, a lot of the time what i'm trying to do is isolate the bit of the framework that needs to change and leave the rest unchanged if possible so that you're reducing the kind of the burden of um, kind of new understanding and and thinking that that other people have to do and it just make that really practical you know it might be thinking through a, a new type of way of working for a, a business unit and just trying to figure out what's the one bit that actually shifts the dial and what they're able to to do and particularly in the near, in the near term that then opens up their ability to actually consume um, higher orders of abstraction so you know use the rest of their structure don't change the whole structure change one piece of it which opens up a new way of kind of thinking or looking or a new kind of practice you're relying on that practice that next step to be the unlocker for the for the for the subsequent steps so yeah. um yeah rather than trying to kind of reframe everything in one go which um, i think i think when you're kind of starting out in strategic work you that's what you you know there's the designer's ego you're always trying to do that. Everything's a yeah. nail, and you're, you've got the strategy hammer. A hundred percent, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you've solved the whole world and everything. But, but I think um, over time you start to try to kind of actually do less and and just figure out how you can kind of plug everything in without yeah. without shifting that much because you're just trying to kind of unlock the possibilities of the next step. Because if you don't get that first step, you know the whole the whole future thing is, yeah. is kind of yeah. pointless anyway. I definitely see that um, it's sort of the Achilles heel of service design, right? Is, is is that wanting to kind of save the world and see everything's connected to everything else. So we have to kind of change the entire system. And um, for those people who sort of know uh, systems thinking, Don, Al Don Alameda has kind of had this sort of list of the, I think it's 14 sort of levers of, of where to kind of intervene in a system and in increasing order of effectiveness, but also difficulty in the bottom one is like change the system. And I, I notice it with students all the time. Sorry, I feel like I'm picking on my students today. But um, there's a, their projects are kind of like, make the world use less plastic and things like that. And it's kind of so so massive. And I think once you get maybe a bit older and more experienced and jaded, you're like, oh, I just want to make this tiny bit of the service a bit less rubbish. Uh, and that would be a win. Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't, I just, I'll just, I'll, I mean, I'll pick on that a little bit because, um, because I think sometimes like the piece that you're looking for is the lever point, right? So it's not yes, necessarily yes. just a tiny piece. Um, it's that one little bit of unlock that allows uh, momentum or flow or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it, like not to get trapped in the, I just want to make the change I can make. Actually, sometimes, you know, the, the one small bit is the bit that's actually the critical, the critical elements of a larger um, a, a larger change. I mean, I think from a stakeholder management point of view and, and from so design leadership, it's a really crucial thing right? that um, particularly if you're kind of coming into something completely new, that's it's clearly sort of needs change, but everyone's a little bit stuck on, on how to do it. I think often changing one or two things that are quite small, but kind of constant irritants, like things that people have been irritated about for ages and approaching them, you know, and they've been locked up in some way or 
uh, some of the reasons why they don't change is because the existing framework actually doesn't sort of consider them a priority or important. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's one of those gap things where two different sort of departments usually feel like the other is responsible for it. And so there's a little gap in the middle where no one really takes care of it. I see that all the time. I don't think it's a particular kind of lens of service design to look at those sort of cross-channel things and, and see the moments where a customer moves from either one step to the next or between channels. There's always these little kind of cracks. Uh, I call them sort of like crevasses, right? It's this little crack. Mm. It doesn't seem like much to the organization from the outside, but if you fall down it as a customer, it's a, it's a nightmare, right? Always the hand of it. <laughs> yeah, it's always the hand. It's transitions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, transitions, yeah. I think, are, the, um, uh, are always the, the biggest biggest problem in, in whatever mm. direction. And in fact, partly it's because I think the things themselves get taken care of. Like the, the sort of, you know, the, I, you know that um, exercise that you do in design school sometimes, which can you, is to, to draw the negative space, uh, the, the spaces between letters or the spaces between objects in order to kind of trick your brain into seeing them differently. That's, actually quite a good kind of metaphor for a framework. Yeah. And, you know, looking at those gaps in between is often really important, um, which kind of maybe brings me on to this idea of the sort of autopilot thing, because I think one of the things that I think design has become a bit kind of process obsessed, uh, or had become, or had become a bit process obsessed, and now it's sort of made its way into kind of product design and and design systems too, obviously another way of kind of, kind of operating a little bit on, on autopilot, I think. They're obviously incredibly useful. I understand the kind of reason for them, particularly at scale, and they create great consistency and uh, speed things up an awful lot. Do you feel like there is a kind of aspect, though, there where um, it, you mentioned this kind of monoculture idea that, and I sort of slightly clickbait in the in the title of this, said, you know, at least boring products and services. I, I posted a thing on Mastodon a little while ago where I had all the, like, I don't know, I had a bunch of different apps and they were all some kind of social media thing, whether they were sort of a Twitter-based thing or a Mastodon-based thing. Or something. And they all just had, they all just looked the same. Right? They all have that same kind of four or five things along the bottom, uh, perhaps a kind of ribbon up the side. I'm looking at one right now, which has got the same kind of structure. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that kind of um, increased process uh, focus on design means that you know, it actually creates kind of things that are pretty bland and boring, that everything starts to look the same? That's such a leading question. It's a terrible research question. <laughs> I mean, you think, I think I'm right about this? Thing? It, it's it's what everybody wants wants to hear us. So, um, I th- I think I think it's I think things, these things are cyclical, and so if you kind of think about it as increasing layers, and and then black boxes, and then and then those are recombined in different ways to get new things, um, you're always going to reach points of kind of peak something um and then they, and then they get recombined in a different way there's a new mm. kind of thing that gets unlocked um so so i don't know that i necessarily like I, I maybe it's an inflection point i feel like we're at an inflection point for um for design where um you know if you look back 10 20 years um there wasn't good design in every app that you used to. I mean, there weren't there weren't apps for. for <laughs> no, there weren't apps um, in my day. There were there weren't there weren't apps in the way that you think of apps now, right? But there was software and um, and there were services, and the bar was pretty low, and um, and, and that bar has risen, um, and and it's become uh, it's become I guess hygiene to have relatively good design um, in packaging or. Uh, software design or, or, or whatever it is. Um, and so that's resulted in a kind of a plateau. Uh, yeah. uh, and that would be, that, that's kind of where my thinking is with it. And so, so, so part of this kind of, okay, process has got us this far. It's helped us to push the boundaries of what we're doing wider and more people are consuming good design than, than, um, than maybe in the past. Um, and actually the, you know, the volume of, things that we're consuming has also gone up. Um, but we maybe need something different for the next step. There's something else that's needed. We need to always have conscious kind of breaks in order to have, um, you know, and, and and have we got boring things? Uh, yeah, I feel pretty bored with a lot of what we, um, what we, we deal with. I think we've sort of run the end of, you know, clean, simple, convenient, uh, you know, these kind of ideas have maybe reached not not necessarily like a limit, because I think there's a lot there's a lot in those ideas, but but they're they're and they're not necessarily easy to achieve. Um, 
but you can look at almost any category and you'll find two or three that are fairly fairly similar i, d- I did an i did an exercise recently doing a scan um for uh for financial services clients and um and it, it was you know that like you're always looking for something interesting um and and then and then it was quite interesting looking for the not so interesting things and actually looking at some of the copycat things in secondary markets was really interesting because they were all the same message over and over again and it was like is this is this somebody that's cleaning up in this context across the whole world by copying and pasting across different markets? Or is it just that these ideas have become so kind of formulaic that um, if you want to be successful, you have a simple, easy, you know, marketing message. And um, that's, 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 uh, I guess the interesting thing, like if you then think about, well, what do you do with that? Um, and then I don't necessarily have an answer. <laughs> so, so I think that's that's where we, you know, we, we need to now start thinking about like, well, if we start reintroducing that kind of idea of good and what is what is a kind of quality output, and and go beyond simple and convenient as the only markers of that, um, what do we? How do we start thinking about distinction again? Maybe that allows a little bit more friction, uh, you know, creativity. Yeah. Uh, kind of possibility for distinctiveness in again, and, and and I guess you know if we if I'm right and we're right and we're at this kind of inflection point, maybe our clients need to start looking for that as well, um, because because they also going to have to look you know look different to to the next thing for it to be a competitive advantage. It's, yeah. it's not it's not an advantage anymore. Yeah, and so that's the thing with process, right? It, it is. Um... I guess that's the, the kind of you know, culturally strategy for breakfast thing, but it's this idea that you know process process is kind of easy to copy, right? and and everyone seems to be doing it too. But it's the you know the execution on it that that makes the the big difference. And I, I you see that kind of all the time with copycat things. Um, Jason Jason Masood, hi, um, said uh, you know feels that like safe is a great example of um, something seductive to people for providing a, a faux simplicity on a complex world, and it kind of feels like that's that's really where we are uh, with a lot of those things. There's this constant um, desire to try and linearize and make something complex into something that's complicated, as in a complicated mm. thing we can kind of take it apart and and into its component parts, work on each bit and put it back together again. With obviously complexity, everything is connected to everything else, and if you pull it apart, well, then you kind of just break the whole ecosystem, which I think has been service design's kind of mantra for forever, which is, you know, to think of the ecosystem. I think businesses really struggle with that because because they're sort of stuck in an industrial mindset of the way they organize. You know, Nicole just said, hi, Nicole, that this thing about, you know, um, if they, they're useful if sort of they describe how people actually work, but they, they can often be sort of prescriptive and taken as rules rather than kind of inspiration. And it seems to me that the, the real struggle with... Um, you know, I, I guess sustainability and climate change is the biggest one, or, uh, where everything really is connected to everything else. Which is for businesses to um, spend the time, I would suggest, on uh, considering the complexity of the problem. And I think frameworks can be very, very useful because they help you explore a complex problem from different ways. They help you force your brain, you know, brains to look in different directions and kind of uh, consider different aspects of things you might inhabit and in speed not always do. But it does feel also that there is a, there's like a, I'm thinking of the, of the canvas of some kind. There needs to be a sort of the box there that's like, what's the maddest version of this? Or what's the thing that kind of completely mm-hmm. blows this up or turns it upside down? It's a thing that Mark Curtis, who's one of the uh, co founders of Fjord, often used to say, is like, oh, you know what this project needs is a, is a moment of madness right? where, where we really kind of just get out of that, um, that sort of process and that routine. But I think that takes time. I think that takes an investment in time to to want to do that. I don't think it's a thing that you can kind of do quickly. Um, right. I think so, because you necessarily make the the work you're doing really messy again, right? You sort of force yourself back into that messy middle. I think when you do that, um, or or do you think you know? Do you disagree or have a different view? No, I mean that's I guess where an example of where they are comfortable, and, and I'm. I'm I can say again, I'm completely uncomfortable with dismissing them because they're such a kind of intrinsic part of the way we work. But but how we work with them is is critical, right? So, if you are 
um, you know, insisting that you do this as an exercise at the end of every workshop that you flip it. I, I worked with somebody uh, years ago who was, you know, had this great, like, you know, make the evil version of it as just as a way of kind of reframing it or what's the dark version. Or it, it, it's a lovely, like, kind of mental flip, but it doesn't work if you do it every single time. Um, and and so I think, you know, how do we kind of keep things alive means that we've got to kind of fight against things being stayed. And and if your framework is contributing to, again, it's like focusing on the work. If the output that you're getting is feeling dull and boring, uh, maybe you need to inject something else into it. Um, but you've got to be looking at the work to understand whether that's the case or not. Um, so, so it's the it's the kind of uncritical use of frameworks that's that's more kind of uh, problematic. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that means that it's the frameworks problem, or the, the operators, the operators problem. But, I, but but we have a responsibility um, to you know make our processes work for us rather mm. than kind of work for them. I mean, it, it's always the operators. <laughs> this it's always a problem between chair and keyboard. You know, there's always the the, the uh, the, the human aspect of it, I think, that where it goes wrong. And I, I kind of feel that that comes back to this idea of... So I'm going to make a yoga reference here. There's a, a, my, my, my wife and I have done Iyengar yoga for a long time. She's a teacher as well, actually. And Iyengar yoga uses props. Right? And the idea being that you, it's better to use a block or a chair or something to, to maintain the integrity of the kind of alignment rather than sort of bend yourself out of shape. But there's also this idea that, you know, um, when you the teacher calls a certain pose, everyone kind of grabs their props kind of automatically. And often a good teacher will go, well, just get rid of the props for a second and see what it feels like mm. without them. Because you, you know, you used a prop as a beginner, that's fine. But after you've been practicing for sort of five or 10 years, mm. why are you still reaching for that without thought? And it feels to me like that's a kind of very, uh, really good sort of analogy for, for this idea of, you know, reaching for the prop and uh, not really thinking and not really reflecting on on on, you know, what is this achieving for us? And I, 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 that if there's a sort of thing, I guess, to come out of this conversation, this idea of really sort of pleading, I guess, keep going back to this idea of speed and time for some time and some part in the process, actually, for, for reflection and thinking and critical kind of thought rather than, you know, well, that seems good enough, kind of bang it out and, and we'll fix it later, which is, I guess, digital's kind of main Achilles heel is that you can just release something and then, fix it up later if it didn't turn out mm. very well. And I think with, so, say, other products and services, and I'm interested in maybe the government work you've done, you kind of can't do that, right? It's certainly with kind of physical products, you actually have to do a lot more testing, but you also have to do a lot more kind of critical thinking about what's happening because it you know, might kill someone. Um, is this true in, in the government work you've done too? Um, I'm just trying to think if that's necessarily... Is that true? Um, I don't know if, if, if it... Well, well, I mean, it depends. It depends on what it is, right? So, so, um, I, yeah, you. That does have that safety. I'm not. I'm not sure. I can. Uh, it it maps um, kind of yeah. directly because um, usually the work that I've done has been perhaps a little bit upstream of like an actual medical outcome. Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that and that that will need to be there. But actually, you've kind of focused on figuring out the work, and so the feedback loop is more about like trying to figure out what's working than necessarily um, what's the kind of implemented outcome at a medical level. Like at the service yeah. level tends to be have slightly different, um, like slightly different kind of parameters than, than the medical. I guess I'm thinking, I mean, the, the people go back and listen to the podcast I did with, um, with Kate Tarling, actually about, so we talked about policy quite a lot and policy as an act of design and this idea of, actually kind of really thinking through what's the intent here, what might be, because policy is also a framework. You hear about policy frameworks all the time. You know, there's an intent of what we're trying to achieve here and then how it actually kind of um, pans out on the ground mm -hmm. and, and spending the time to really kind of rigorously, critically uh, reflect and analyze that because, as well, you know, the roadway debt scandal in Australia is a really good example of how something like that can go wrong. People can Google that because we don't have time, but it's, yeah. uh, you know, where this idea of a kind of idea up here gets just kind of pushed through almost like a kind of Play-Doh, um, uh, one of those, you know, those um, forms that you kind of push Play-Doh through and all the kind of spaghetti comes out and then it, it, it all goes wrong. What, what it does make me think of is like regulatory frameworks and, yeah. and how they are 
um, quite often described. I mean, designers get kind of hands off about it or scared about it, or it's this compliance thing that needs to go, you know, that's a step down the line that we've got to kind of pass. But actually, um, uh, a lot of the time, you know, that framework has a spirit and and it's actually quite close to what we're trying to do a lot of the time. Like it's mm. trying to protect you, protect consumers or protect people that are using it. Um, and so it has an outcome in mind, but then it tries to wrap it in, in a particular kind of framework and people then start adhering to the framework. Whereas yeah. actually if you, if you step back from that and say, well, what's this, what's the intent of this and what are you trying to actually accomplish yeah. with this? A lot of the time you can actually go quite, you know, you, you can you can marry the best outcome for the for the for the, the um for the for the the person who's impacted um to the spirit of the law and, and that's that's uh yeah, yeah uh, that's okay. some, something to kind of always hold to that black spirit versus the the letter and maybe that's the same thing for frameworks. It's like, well what's the spirit of this framework? Um and how do I kind of consume that and and, and interpret it in my own practice rather than yeah. um just kind of follow the the letter of it. I remember working on a, I think I mentioned this in the Kate Tarling podcast, actually, that the, there was a project I worked on for a, a large government organization, public organization, in, um, government organization in, in Australia. And, and there was this thing that kept coming up where in workshops, and we can't do that because, you know, policy. And eventually we got the policy person in. And, the, and every time that came up, they went, no, it's, it's really not policy. There's, uh, well, people kept saying that's the law. And they said, no, there's the law. Here's our policy as a response to that law. And then here's how we've kind of, it, this gets interpreted by us all the time as kind of the dogma and there's these dis- different levels and it gets sort of narrower and narrower or more fixed the further down you go. And as you're saying, if you actually take the effort and time to kind of st- step up a level, you actually get much more uh, wiggle room in terms of the things you can explore. Absolutely. De- if designers aren't reading the regulations themselves, they're missing a trick. Like, yeah, like yeah. I, I, I keep detailed notes about all the regulatory <laughs> frameworks, because usually, um, you know, you, you're there's there's the the legal teams and the compliance teams, and they're kind of quite first in 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 the in the letter of it. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of other people that are kind of it's almost hearsay around the it edges, is, yeah. and yeah. and you can you can kind of go quite quickly through that. Actually, one of the um, things that we found when we were doing the research on this was the 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 end users of this service. I can't say who it was, but the end users of this service. The way that people kind of knew, oh, this is what you can and can't do, uh, was because of a Facebook group. That because, and partly it was, it was a, it's kind of a, a language problem uh, and a design problem in that the policy documents are so sort of arcane and opaque in the language that they were written in um, that, that it was sort of reinterpreted and the simplified version was the thing that was circulating on Facebook. And a lot of it was wrong. A lot of it really was hearsay. You know, and then it's it's it just sort of becomes the the norm. The classic of like post-it notes in the call center. That's the the kind of actual source of truth, not the <laughs> exactly not the policy. So look, we're um, we're coming up for time. Um, what are your hopes for for Path? Um, it's, we've got quite a lot going on. I'm trying to um, two years old uh, uh, studio. Um, largely uh, largely me as a practitioner um, and intentionally kind of keeping it small and working with networks of people. Um, but uh, trying to work at finding what the right kind of fit is and, and in the in the context of, I guess, a market that has shifted a lot from um, kind of buying projects from agencies to building a lot in-house and, um, and, and yeah, so um, experimenting a lot to try to kind of find the right... Um, the the right kind of way of of working um, with that market, um, and then and then I mean it's interesting talking about frameworks because um, building a building a lot um, uh, and and trying to kind of embed some stuff into some tools, um, and so frameworks kind of come up as as a kind of a key part of that is almost the the kind of intellectual bedrock of um, of of whatever it is that you're trying to build. Um, so so I'm trying to. Build a lot, um, build a practice, um, and then and then and then working with some some really interesting clients to kind of implement some of these things at scale, which is this really great kind of testing bed. Yeah. So um, the way I look at it is, um, I, I, mean, I guess product market fit's not a bad kind of idea for the um, the, the way um, the way the practice is evolving. Um, we're we're kind of working working at trying to trying to trying to find find the right fit for I guess a vehicle that helps keep trying to trying to kind of grow things and do things a little bit differently all the time and kind of keep keep on the on the edge of 
um, evolving things, which is where, where I'm kind of happy, <laughs> happy in my practice when I'm kind of doing something, something new or different or kind of evolving something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, clients mostly in Australia or, or all over the world? Um, mostly in Australia, a little bit of a mix, um, but yeah, a lot of um, a lot of kind of large um, large financial services companies um, is probably the 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 the, the mainstay. Um, of which, if you know Australia, um, that's that's the it's quite a lot the, of kind of the, the 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 bulk of the 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 market here. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but also, you know. Uh, big problems around scale and so that's the you know the elements of my practice that i think is kind of the most interesting and challenging is how do you kind of take these these kind of practices and then grow them out across uh large teams large kind of volumes or quantity of work and and, and a lot of my practices at that kind of yeah. um thinking about a portfolio of work and how it all knits together not necessarily just kind of individual individual pieces so the show is uh, named after the Ray and Charles Eames film, Powers of Ten, uh, which was about the relative size of things in the universe, which is for me the kind of the most useful metaphor for service design on that idea of kind of moving between different levels of Zoom and the kind of similarities actually and kind of echoes there. And so the, the very last question is always, uh, what one small thing is either either o- overlooked or could be redesigned that would have an outsized effect on the world? Um, I that. Uh, this is, maybe it's a glib answer, but but it's something I've just been thinking about a lot. Um, I'm really interested in, I don't know if this is a small thing, maybe this isn't a small thing at all, but um, but how batteries kind of flow, like battery flow and how there's this kind of behavioral piece around batteries that that um, that as we kind of get more used to batteries, we kind of embedding them in, in everything and they all become interconnected with each other. And, and so this is things like uh, getting the, the grid connected up with your car so that you kind of charging at the right times. Um, and I got obsessed a little while ago about how this flows all the way down to kind of you know, charging headphones off your phone or, you know, all mm. this kind of stuff. So um, I, I like it. I like it as a problem um, because it's, uh, it's such a kind of clear behavior and technology and system kind of example. Um, so it feels like there's something kind of interesting in this, like thinking about the power grid as something that you kind of carry with you that's like a really nice kind of interconnected small thing that goes to a bigger thing yeah charging and charges they're a kind of interesting space at the moment i mean obviously in auto, uh, automotive world there's a there's a big thing going on there I mean, it's, uh, it seems yeah. likely that tesla is going to be a a, a charger company uh, perhaps more so than it is a car company it's interesting to see uh thank you so much for being my guest on power of 10 where can people find you Where's the best place? Is it is it Path or is it the, um, the best place? Is my my website pathventures.io. I, I use it quite extensively, and there's a, a bit of uh, a, a bit of kind of framework tools um, stuff that 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 I'll that I'll be I'll be releasing soon. And yeah. um, there's quite a bit of stuff there that's um, that's nearly, nearly nearly ready to be to be shared. And on social media, LinkedIn is is the kind of the main. Place. Yeah, these 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 days, um, I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of checked out of <laughs> almost every, everything, out everything else. else. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for being my guest on Power Ten. It's lovely, Andy. Thanks. Thanks for the chat. It's been really good. So, if you've been watching and listening to Power of Ten, if you would like to find anything more, you can find. Um, wait, well, search my name, April Lane, really uh, everywhere. You'll find me on Mastodon. I've kind of pretty much given up on Twitter. Uh, you'll find all the show links um, at palain.com where you can find you find more episodes. You can uh, check out my leadership coaching practice, uh, online courses, sign up for the, my very irregular newsletter. I, I need to try and make it become more regular called Doctor's Note. If you're looking at this on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of more stuff that I'm going to be doing on YouTube. So give it a thumbs up or uh, subscribe. If you've got any thoughts, put them in the comments. I know for many people, this uh, live stream was, was very early in the morning. And for the Americans, you'll all be asleep. So if you've got any thoughts about it, then uh, pop a comment in and uh, I can respond. That's the nice thing about YouTube versus the podcast. This will also appear on the the podcast feed. All the links will be in the show notes down there. Uh, Thanks for listening and watching. And I'll see you next time. 